I know I don't really need to say this, but I need to think of something to talk about to start this video off, so I'll say it anyway. It's safe to say in the last 10 years before this next film came out, Studio Ghibli has really solidified themselves as a perennial animation powerhouse with films like Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle and Ponyo, arguably some of the best animated films ever released. But just because they have soared to heights that barely anyone in their field has reached up to at this point, doesn't mean they've seen every obstacle and knows how to prepare for it beforehand. That's what happened during the 11 months of production both inside and outside the studio regarding the status and beliefs of both Hayao Miyazaki and his son Goro, who was making his first attempt at directing since he was at the helm of critically the worst film the studio ever put out in Tales from Earthsea. But it's more than just Goro's shot at redemption. Let's see how the studio achieved mythical status on the latest edition of the Studio Ghibli Project, episode 19, From Up on Poppy Hill. The story is set in 1963 and follows the relationship between Umi, who is trying to cope with the loss of her father who was killed in the Korean War, and Shun, a member of their school's newspaper club who is fighting to save their school's broken down clubhouse known as the Latin Quarter. After hanging out with each other for a while, they both discover they have the same father, putting their relationship on hold as they find out more about their family history. And I know what you're thinking, and don't worry, it doesn't go where you think it's going. I know that there's some people watching this who are thinking immediately of Sweet Home Alabama in their head, and I know because that's exactly what happened to me when I first saw this, but this is the only spoiler I'm going to say regarding this film. No, they're not actually blood related, and no, they don't have the same father, and that is all I'm going to say. I mean, it, it's Hayao Miyazaki, come on, he, he's not just going to go succumb to this shit. After Tales from Earthsea in 2006, both Hayao Miyazaki and his son Goro were still on sour turns with each other. They didn't want to talk to each other, and while Hayao was going along directing and writing new films, whether it's a theatrical release or a short film exclusively for the Ghibli Museum because it would be during this time frame where he would make a lot of those, Goro had been contemplating whether he actually wants to work in the world of animation like his father. But in April of 2010, Goro gets another shot when he's approached by his father to direct Ghibli's new film, a sign that maybe Hayao has put this whole Tales from Earth Sea debacle all behind him and decide to give him another chance, and production began three months later. Both Hayao and Goro acknowledge in their own way that this is Goro's film. They both understand that because this has the Miyazaki name on it, and that Hayao was writing it, that people would assume that this would be Hayao's film. So they both did collectively as best as they can to make sure that Goro did as much as he can, while Hayao did as much as he can do, but not as much as Goro. This is shown through accounts of Goro supposedly hiding his initial storyboards from his father. Meanwhile, Hayao doesn't go on him as much as he would any other director that's not himself or Isao Takahata. From here, it's business as usual, but its biggest challenge was yet to come. It was March 11th, 2011. The northeastern coast of Japan, approximately 250 miles from Tokyo, was hit with a magnitude earthquake measured anywhere between 9.0 and 9.1 and triggered a massive tsunami that killed anywhere between 10 to 19,000 people, with thousands more injured or missing. The earthquake and tsunami also caused the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, the biggest such disaster since Chernobyl which led to the evacuation of almost 154,000 people living near the plant and working at the plant, making the plant itself and the surrounding area one of the most toxic places on Earth. And any place that still had power was being affected by rolling blackouts across the area. The animators who were working on the film were sent home, and it was decided by Goro that while the production for the film is important and the release date for the film was never changed, the studio was going to be shut down for a few days. The only person who didn't support that decision was Hayao, who convinced Goro and Toshio Suzuki that they should keep the production going by saying, quote, we shouldn't abandon the production site. And it's precisely in times like these that we must spin a myth to show that we kept drawing despite any aftershocks. 
it was at this moment Goro knew what it's like to be at the helm of a Ghibli film, to put your blood, sweat, and tears into every intricate detail and every single frame in a film you're directing. A high standard unlike any other in its field. It's this new mindset that connected the minds of both men to continue working on a film that was halfway done before the incident and stayed true to their release date so they can have a film out for a country that is recovering from one of the worst calamities in history. With that in mind, Goro worked in the studio all day and eventually all night with the animation staff as the studio elected to do so to avoid rolling blackouts. And with that plan in place, production was finished in June of 2011, about a few weeks before the film was set to release. What Ghibli ended up doing in the end was easing the population during a current crisis with elements from the past. This is the first time since Whisper of the Heart that Miyazaki wrote a slice of life script, and it's the first time since My Neighbor's The Yamadas that the studio itself adapted something like this. And just like with Whisper of the Heart, Miyazaki knows how to write characters naturally. The premise lets the emotions from both Umi and Shun flow naturally, which allowed more honesty and hard-hitting moments to flow with little to no drama or any sense of concern. And the only instance that I remember where there was even close to a serious concern, the movie ends up pointing out that it doesn't really mean anything in the end. The animation, as usual, is really good. The views of an early 60s Japanese seaside town looking out in the ocean is breathtaking and the clubhouse especially is atmospheric at times with the shots of the stacked books and winding staircases. The only main complaint I've heard with the animation is that it doesn't look like what it does in the original manga and to that I'm not really surprised at all Ghibli went with their own animation style. Because going back to My Neighbors the Yamadas, th that was really the last time that Ghibli didn't work with an animation that was their own and it ended up not doing well in the end in the box office so my best guess is that they were playing it safe here I don't blame them for doing it and it, it still looks pretty good regardless instead of the slow paced approach of Joe Hisaishi once again it is someone different at the command for the soundtrack in music producer Satoshi Takabe the charming old-fashioned track set the time period fairly well and I think he did a pretty good job on the soundtrack as usual I watched the English dub for these films all I know about the Japanese dub is that Umi and Shun had great chemistry and was the forefront of the cast. If that was the case, the dub was the exact opposite. While there was still pretty good chemistry between the English voice actors, the supporting cast overshadowed them instead of the other way around, which wouldn't be an issue for me if there wasn't a very star-studded supporting cast with people like Jamie Lee Curtis, Gillian Anderson, who was on Mononoke, I believe, Bo Bridges, Aubrey Plaza from Parks and Rec, Jeff Dunham, and Ron Howard. There are a few ways to look at this film. As a Ghibli film, it's yet another great film with a valuable message. As the latest film from Goro Miyazaki compared to his last film, this is a fucking masterpiece. As a film for post-quake Japan, this was a good breath of fresh air. Shit, I just realized what I just said. If you're a fan of any of Ghibli's slice of life films from the early to mid 90s, you would love this movie. If you're a fan of just normal slice of life in general, chances are you'll probably like this movie. This does have a campy feel to it at times, which really appeals it to me, and I can see why it also appeals to a lot of people, and how this got a lot of attention and a lot of praise compared to Goro's last film. Overall, it's a good introduction to what Ghibli did before their 21st century classics came around the corner, and with that, I'm going to give From Up on Poppy Hill an 8 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you like it, hit the like button down below. Or if you want to see more, you can hit subscribe. If you want to see the videos I've made, there are some on the screen as well as down in the channel. And with that, my name is Payne, and I'll see you in the next video. See you guys.